Hey, Sam, how's it going, man? I'm Jax Jones. It's going pretty well. How are you? Oh, really good. It looks like you're in an office there at the moment. It's true. I, I, I am in an office. We've been pretty fortunate to be able to have offices open all throughout the pandemic. Um, it's just been super valuable. I mean, there, there are so many things that are just a little bit easier when you can talk yeah. in person. You're, um, but you're all the way in Hong Kong, right? Yeah. It looks like you're kind of in a gaming chair. Is that is that how you? Yeah, we all we all changed the gaming chairs. I mean, I, I think we just tried out a bunch of chairs, and everyone who tried it just thought the gaming chair is just the best chair. So you've got like fifty of them. It's oh. amazing. <laughs> nice, good choice. I think just for for our uh, audience, I think it'd be helpful just to ask you to reflect again just on how you arrived to be sitting in that chair in Hong Kong, right? Trading crypto, setting up an exchange and doing all these things we're going to talk about today. Totally. So, you know, I, I went to MIT um, where I had uh, I learned a lot about myself, including that I, I didn't want to do physics um, and I that I could fill up enormous numbers of hours playing League of Legends if I really tried. Um, <laughs> yeah. And I so I didn't know what to do with my life, um, but sort of wandered into effective altruism. Um, it wasn't really one, it was, you know, a, a somewhat direct path there, I guess, um, which is basically a movement looking at, um, you know, if you're trying to figure out how you can do the most good with your life, what should you do? Um, and I, there's a lot of answers to that question. And I think some of the most compelling are like, find a really great organization and help spearhead it. Um, but I, you know, one thing that you can try and do is um, is figure out how you can donate as much as you can to effective organizations. And, you know, sometimes, frankly, you'll go to them and be like, yo, do you want me as an employee? Drop my money. You're like, we do not want you as an employee. I'm sorry. No offense. You no. we'll take your money. Um, and so, um, <laughs> I, you know, I, it's like, I just try to be leafleting. Like, no, no one want me as a leafleter. I'm not good. Uh, and, um, I, and, uh, and so anyway, um, you know, thought about what, what that would mean, uh, and ended up on Wall Street uh, trading ETFs at Jane Street Capital. Um, it's a really great place, and um, you know, learned a ton there, uh, and you know, it kind of gave me a ton of respect and responsibility, and you know, really grateful for that. Um, and you know, after after a few years, kind of felt like I started to get a bit restless, and felt like it, it was time to start up my own thing. And so, um, you know, left, and this is late 2017. When you know you walk down the streets, you hear two people talking. You're like, that's probably about Bitcoin. I mean, I don't know, but the, you know, pretty likely. Um, and um, basically, just had a ton of priors uh, that made me think there might be a lot of money to be made trading crypto. I just seemed very likely to be a field where there is a ton of demand, a ton of volatility, a ton of wackiness and craziness, and just not very much liquidity or infrastructure to support that. And so there might be a pretty big role to carve out providing that. Um, and so anyway, um, started trading crypto, uh, built out a, a crypto firm and, um, you know, there was, you know, there were in fact a lot of good trades to do. Um, a lot of the difficulty wasn't even finding the good trades. Sometimes those are obvious. The difficulty sometimes was figuring out how to do them. Um, how right. do you, how to do it without your bank account shutting you down? Um, and mm. the bank compliance officers were not a fan of crypto trading firms. It just like checked all the boxes they didn't want. And. Um, well, did they just call you a money launderer? I would imagine. They can't, right. Well, because you're not, you're not laundering money, so they can't quite call you one. What you do though <laughs> is you check a lot of the red flags that money yeah. launderers check, and it's in yeah. fact for an innocuous reason. But it's sort of like you're telling me that every single f-ing day you send a ten million dollar wire transfer between two different countries, two different currencies, two unrelated entities, always in the same direction. It's mm. like what you think yeah. that is. Like what business has only one directional flow, huge size every day cross like, and like the yeah. answer is I'm doing Bitcoin arbitrage between Japanese and US exchange. But that's not usually the answer when you see that fact pattern. Yeah. And and yeah. it's basically just like the clients department's like, look, I could get fired for allowing this account. Like the, the bar for me allowing this has to be that I'm so, so f-ing confident that nothing mm-hmm. is bad is going to happen here, that no one is ever going to like, give me scrutiny for having allowed, you know, this fact pattern to exist. There's a lot of layers to you, and you're kind of building that that, that slowly. Yeah. Or I might ask, mega bloody fast from 2017, because <laughs> I still don't f- understand how you did it in four years. And this is the, the, the genius of the story. So how did you get to Hong Kong? And then just yeah. tell us the, the, the progression between your different things, right? Right up to Serum. Totally. So, you know, I, 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 Alameda is a crypto trading firm, and 
by and large, sort of the motto as a, as a proprietary trading firm is all press is bad press. You never want anyone, like, it's like, why would you want anyone to know you exist? Like, there's sort of nothing but bad reasons. Um, and, and that's sort of what we've been following. Uh, but that started to change in late 2018 um, for a number of reasons, one of which was, you know, we'd start to spin up an OTC desk and we wanted to, you know, find institutional counterparties um, to provide liquidity to there. Um, and, and so we'd started to do a little bit of biz dev, you know, a little bit of reaching out and, um, you know, for the first times. And, and anyway, went to a, a crypto conference in Macau um, and it is my first time in Asia since, you know, leaving Jane Street and basically immediately realized like, holy shit, there's a lot of meetings I want to have. Like, I just like, here's 17 people I want to talk to. And it's, it's a three day trip. And so on, on day three, um, you cancel my return flight and rented out a WeWork in Hong Kong. And, and and then sort of like started having the meetings. Um, and it was sort of eye-opening. And, and all of a sudden, sort of I had this sense of like, oh, wow, all these things I thought I could never do seem a little less impossible now. Because mm, okay. like, you know, starting to meet some people, starting to build some networks, some relationships. Um, and uh, one of the things that had been really bubbling up there was our frustration with the exchanges and exchanges are everything in crypto like this is not true in traditional finance right like no one's like oh i got f-ed over by the nazi yesterday right like like that no one talks about it because what what exchanges are actually in traditional finance it's it's, it's a matching engine right it's this back-end technology which it's important but it's just one piece of the puzzle um and what's the and- difference between an exchange in the crypto space and traditional finance in a crypto space, it's every piece. And so if you imagine you buy Apple stock, right, you're probably going like Robinhood to Citadel to, you know, some clearing firms some custodians in the back and some technology providers. Eventually, you go to a dark pool, then to another liquidity fire, and then finally you end up on NYSE, right? And then you go through the whole thing on the other side. In crypto, there's nothing but the buyer, the seller, and the exchange. And so the exchange is everything from the mobile app, the GUI, the API, the brand, the retail facing piece, the custodian, the clearing firm, the product design, the matching engine, the clearing, the risk engine, the liquidation, like every part of the process that sits between the buyer and the seller is part of the exchange in crypto. And so it's really all of those firms sort of rolled up into one coherent product. Um, you got to be, it, it's all in, right? With it. If, if you build one, you take all the risk, right? But if, but if you're if you're dealing with an exchange, you're, again, you take all the risk. That's right. And, um, and so, you know, they're huge in crypto and most of people's crypto experiences are dominated by the exchanges that they interact with and, and the tokens that they trade um, or invest in or, or derivatives or whatever. Um, so the really, really central piece of, of the ecosystem, uh, despite that though, they were kind of shit. And I mean, especially the derivatives exchanges had really, really serious issues. And you can sort of enumerate them, but it almost is too kind to them to enumerate the specific issues because really what happened was they are just bad. They had bad designs from the ground up. And that just led to all these issues. They're losing a million dollars a day of customer funds um, to having incompetent risk engines. Um, there is serious regulatory doom, you know, pending, uh, you know, one of the, the biggest names. Um, they had this ridiculous margining system where every single different product you wanted to trade on an, on an exchange, you had to completely separately collateralize. And so if you want to go trade Ripple futures, you had to go buy spot Ripple tokens and move into Ripple futures margin wallet to trade Ripple futures. And if you want to trade ETH futures, you take out your Ripple, you sell it for Bitcoin, use the Bitcoin to buy ETH, you move ETH into your ETH futures margin wallet, and then you can trade ETH futures. And so like 80% of what you're doing is is moving like little dongles around in order to just be able to, to then do the trade that you actually wanted to do and you have no flexibility on what your collateral is, and you can get liquidated on your Ripple futures position completely independent of, of however much Ethereum you have. And, and, and so it's just, it's a mess, and it, and it leads to all these downstream issues as well. And um, I guess and that's it, very complicated for your average user as well. Yeah, who it's are less complicated for able, the, isn't it? It's one of these rare things which is bad in every way. It's complicated for the average user. It's terrifying for the institutional user. It's like, you're telling us we can get liquidated despite having a billion dollars on the platform because we didn't remember to collateralize one for 300 different wallets. You know, like they don't want to hear that. The risk departments don't want to hear that. Um, And it's also one of these things that is both complicating and also um, reduces the flexibility. Like, Like it's sort of like, it gives you fewer choices about what you can do and simultaneously 
also um, makes it more annoying to use. And, and so, you know, there, that, that's sort of one of the fundamental issues, but there's just a ton of things. And and it had been sort of mounting over the course of that year as we've been using these products, like, geez, like, we can do better than that. And like, we really want to. Um, but despite that, we basically thought it was hopeless. Um, we thought we could succeed at building a, a cool product, but we did not think that we could succeed at uh, figuring out how to get any users. And, you know, our sense of like the odds that we would be able to get significant numbers of users sort of went up from, you know, 2% to 15%. And at that point, um, just made a snap call, we're gonna go for this. Um, you know, even though we think we're gonna fail to get users, it's so high upside that we would be negligent not to try. Um, and so, you know, called up, you know, co my co-founder and, and CTO and, and college roommate and said, all right, do you want to do this? And he's like, yeah. And and so we started building out FTX. I love the I love the blase nature of it. It was just like, yeah, called up my college roommate and there it was 10 billion later. Just staying on FTX, right? I've got two quick questions and we're going to keep on the surface of what you're doing. And then we can start to drill down, I think, more successfully. But are you, you're trading, what, $10 billion a day on FTX? Is, is that true? Yeah, it's 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 averaged about $14 billion in the last month of, of daily volume on FTX. It's insane. And the second question, yeah. just to tee up uh, some thought process down, down you know, uh, further into the conversation. You you can't trade in America for obvious reasons. But is there? Is, have, have I heard the rumors that you're going to skinny down the product? in order to yeah. offer maybe a more vanilla version of FTX to get it into the US market. And then hope your lobbying and all the rest of it that you're doing, these guys wake up and give you a chance. Yeah, so there is a, a US uh, product, it's FTX.US, and it is a lame version of FTX, certainly. Uh, it doesn't have, <laughs> you know, almost any of our innovative products on it, but, you know, as far as places to buy, you know, spot cryptocurrencies with, with uh, you know, with fiat currencies go, I think it's pretty good, you know, within that sort of limited design space. Um, um, and, and, and yeah, I think the big thing is there is basically that, uh, and there, there's a bunch of regulations, but the biggest is the CFTC, which is basically taking the reasonable position that this is, you know, a regulated financial activity that would require a license. Um, it has also taken the reasonable position that they have not built a license for it yet because it's a complicated new field. Unfortunately, yeah. those positions don't combine super well. Um, and so, you know, because of that, it's very difficult to, you know, find a pathway for offering crypto derivatives in the U.S. right now. Um, yeah. And so the, the U.S. platform doesn't have any of the, the derivatives products on it, which are the bulk of the volume on the, yeah. the main platform. Yeah, but, mm. but spot products, no, no issue at all, right? Uh, spot products for, for cryptocurrencies, which the SEC doesn't deem to be potentially unregistered securities. Okay, so XRP? Yeah, no. interesting case. Uh, we do not list XRP uh, on the, the U.S. exchange. That has been a borderline case for a while. And there's, you know, an active lawsuit going on right now, uh, you know, between the SEC and, and Ripple about whether it is, in fact, an unregistered security or not. And you're, do you have a view? I, you know, I don't have, I don't think it's an obvious answer. I mean, it's, it, it, it sort of gets to some interesting questions of what you care about as a regulator and what you're trying to regulate in the first place. Because one of the weird properties of, of this particular area of, of law is, let's say that you have you make a token and you say, I'm gonna give $10 every day to the, to the token holders. That, I don't know, maybe, you know, there's questions whether that's a security. Let's say instead you made a token and you said, this token is a scam, it has nothing. We're never gonna do anything for this token. If you buy this, like, haha, jokes on you. This is basically a Ponzi scheme. That's probably not a security, right? And, and that's actually more likely to be legal in the US. Um, and, it's sort of not clear that's exactly where you want things to end up, but that is sort of where they do end up because, um, you know, what this is basically surrounding is like, are you making, you know, sort of claims or promises about, you know, what creates value for this token in specific ways? And and if so, then you would have to register it, uh, you know, via a scheme that isn't really built out for digital assets yet. Well, I'm going to come back to XRP and, and, and these coins uh, a bit later, but just on your on the stuff that you're doing, you also have Alameda Research. Which is I understand comes back to you know your your roots in in, in California, uh, but tell us a little bit yep. about. To, I mean, I understand research is uh, probably a stretch that there's some research going on, but it's really a trading firm. But perhaps you yep. want to give it to your talk in your own uh, terms what what you do there. Yeah, 
So, and, you know, I, I will say that I've been, you know, fortunate to be able to hire a lot of great people there and be able to take it a big step back um, and focus on on building out FTX. Um, but, you know, what, what Alameda does basically, I mean, what it came from originally was arbitrage. Like the core original trade is basically like, um, you know, you find one exchange where Bitcoin's trading for $10,000, another where it's trading for $11,000. You buy it for $10,000, you sell, sell it for $11,000, and you've made 1000 bucks. And, you know, that sounds like sort of this stupid toy example that couldn't be true, but in crypto it is true sometimes. Like literally that thing does happen. But when you try and do it, you start to realize why it can be true. Because so much of the infrastructure is sort of janky enough that it's actually often quite difficult to execute that efficiently. Um, even though it sounds quite simple, because, you know, any any one of those exchanges, you could lock up your funds, um, you know, you could have just withdrawal limits that made it infeasible. Your bank could refuse to let you transfer dollars between them. Um, and, you know, there's just like actually a lot of ways that this can go wrong. Um, and a lot of things you need to get going uh, in order to make it work. And so, you know, it's 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 not it's not as, as easy as it sounds to do this in crypto. And the logistics of it end up often being the hardest part. It's through Alameda that you kind of did your arbitrage work, right? Yeah. And- uh, between a, a Japanese and U- U.S. Bitcoin, and I'm sure some other things along the way. Um, what made you? I, I have two quick questions, and just, again, more for context for later. Like, what made you take some of these risks? Like, I can only imagine entering the Japanese market and how they love. They've got a big issue with trust and things yep. being proven. And I can just imagine that you had a whole bunch of doors that were slammed on you, just down oh, to yeah. lawyers and bank accounts. As you've already alluded to it. That to me is massive risk. So then you've got to put sample trades down, then bring them up bit by bit by bit. How do you ever get a chance to trade mass volume? And how do yeah. you do it so quick? It's, you know, I think it's one of these things where, like, you can ask, like, what's the secret formula here, right? Like, what's what's the thing no one else understood? That's like, oh, man, you get this, like, the, you know, one, one cute trick to, to, to make a billion dollars or whatever. Um, and, and I think that's sort of the answer in the end, um, which I think is pretty interesting, is that, it, there almost wasn't one trick. It was more like just doing a lot of things quickly and well and doggedly. And um, and and what do I mean by that? Like a lot of these trades, you had to, you know, you could jump through 16 hoops and run into 16 brick walls and break through each one and still have no ability to make money doing a trade. And there's still barriers. And you do number 17, you still no ability to make money. And you do number 18, and then all of a sudden the trade's unlocked and you can make a lot of money doing it. And and it's one of these things where like the answer is in some sense a straightforward, obvious answer of like, yeah, there's some unknown number of barriers. And once you break through all of them, then you can do the trade. But it doesn't feel like that at the time. It feels like this totally Sisyphean, you know, feeling of like, oh, God, like they found yet another way to stop us. Like this is hopeless. We're never going to figure this out. And, and, you know, some of the answer is basically just having an instinct for is this theoretically doable? Like, is there light at the end of the tunnel somewhere here? And if so, and if it's valuable enough to do it, just keep going. You know, someone throws another roadblock, be creative. You know, don't sort of say like, oh, well, our system can't handle that. Be like, fine, we'll build a new system. You know, you're gonna make us jump through that hoop. We'll learn how to do it. And we'll do that as fast as we can. We'll drop everything we're doing to figure out how to jump through that weird hoop that you just decided was important for us to know how to jump through. Um, Okay. And, and then, you know, we'll do it. And then, oh God, there's another hoop. All right, we'll jump through that one too. And just not giving up, being super dogged and super creative about these. And, you know, being willing to just keep thinking of solutions that other people just wouldn't do, not because they're wrong or bad or evil or hard even, just because they're not what you do in, in some sort of like hard to define way of like, you know, I don't know, that's not, not, not what you do in that case, you know? You're supposed to do this other thing. You're like, what you mean supposed to, you know? Just to yeah. touch on the kind of price differences you mentioned earlier, like, so Bitcoin yeah. costs more in Hong Kong than in America. Why is that at that point? Uh, yeah, so, you know, why why was there this sort of like big difference between Japanese and American Bitcoin yeah. exchange prices? So, you know, the basic answer is that this is, you know, late 2017, early 2018, there's a ton of Japanese people want to buy a lot of Bitcoins. And so they were, they were buying, you know, a billion dollars a day of crypto. And... Um, you know, that was a huge amount of inflows in Japan and it just overwhelmed the liquidity sources. There just weren't, there are more buyers and sellers in Japan. And because of all of these banking, like difficulties and withdrawal limits and everything else, and because there's a new space without lots of established big financial players 
no one had the huge balance sheets to support this trade. There's just like the world wasn't collectively able to provide as much liquidity as these customers were demanding by buying. And so they just lift all the offers and then they lift more and then they lift more and more and the price would go up and up and up. And the only thing that stops this from happening is if you actually have um, people who can do this arbitrage in big enough size that, you know, they can they can close that spread, you know, and um, and, and what happened was basically that, like, you just, yeah, the, the demand outstripped the supply of liquidity. And so the prices started to diverge. And, you know, the thing that was needed to bring it back in line was some trading firm to be able to, you know, buy as much Bitcoin as was needed in the United States and send it to Japan and, and sell it there. It, it, it's interesting because we're both off script, both passionate about finding answers to, to different parts of the, the, the puzzle. So, but let, let's last thing on the surface, and then we got a stream of questions that fit, seem more logical. So you've got you've you've kind of got this, you know. I think FTX still is centralized. You've then got this DeFi initiative, right? Project Serum. Um, is would you consider that your hobby project or your third real focus? Like you got Alameda, you've got FTX, and then you've got the, you've got this Project Serum. Yeah, it's interesting. And, and and one of the core things about it is that it is decentralized. And so there's a limit to how involved I can be. You know, there's a limit to how much it, it can't just be the, the, the Sam Bankman Fried Variety Hour. Um, you know, that that's not a decentralized protocol. And so, you know, I'm doing what I can to support it. Um, and, uh, you know, happy to help it any way I can. And, and you know, it was, was, you know, probably pretty important in the beginning in, in building out um, some of the, 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 the infrastructure and the, the philosophy behind it. Um, but, you know, over time, it's, um, you know, it's becoming more and more just in, in a bunch of random people's hands. And that's sort of how it has to be. Someone uh, online labeled you as a $10 billion man. I mean, there could be worse titles, I guess, right? It's not too bad, all things considered. Yeah, how you might spend that money later and whether you can unwind that position in, in, <laughs> in order to allocate it out. But I'm interested in... Where did you make most of your, your, your kind of net gain? And do you remember the emotions when you knew this could, this could scale up? I mean, the way I want to ask that is, do you remember your first big win and how did it feel? The first huge win was the Japan ARP. That was the first time that we sort of like put everything together for not nearly as big of a size as we were hoping. We could have made 10 times as much if we'd had a better setup at the time, but, but for big size. I mean, for a size that just clearly felt like, okay, you know, this is, if this is all it ever is, um, forever, like this is great. You, you know, we, we, you know, this is what are we talking about at the time. So it was, I mean, just just giving ballparks. You know, I think we we're doing ten million, fifteen million dollars a day of volume on it, and you know, the spreads were between five and twenty percent. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So you can sort of do the math there, and it's 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 a non-trivial amount of, of of profit from that as a good trade. Um, and 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 it was just a sort of trade that like you just don't see in the rest of the world. It's just like the spreads are too big. Um, and the sort of trade that, that you might just doubt could exist, could really be real in crypto. And at some point we just realized like, no, it's real. Like, you know, this is not um, not all just sort of one long red herring. Um, and it was a really great feeling when we sort of put that together. I mean, you know, we've, we've been sort of toiling trading in Alameda for um, a while, um, you know, probably two months or so before we made any money. And, you know, basically what would happen is just trade after trade after trade we'd like not quite be able to do, you know, we'd be have two of the three necessary components. We have the two exchanges, but we wouldn't have the bank account that we need or, you know, whatever. Um, and it sort of felt like unlucky each time. And like, oh boy, we're, we're, we're pretty close to being able to do this. Like, geez, you know, um, I, it kept not happening. And I think this is one of these points where like one of the conclusions you could draw was like, it just is never going to happen. And another conclusion you try is like, no, we're two thirds of the way there. It's been two months. Let's give it another month. It, it turns out the second conclusion was right. And, you know, I, I think there's sort of like, you know, we started to get a taste of it with some trades where we had limits, we had withdrawal limits and we didn't have that much capital, but we're able to do them and able to clearly make money doing them, albeit not as nearly as much as we could have made if we'd had no withdrawal limits on the exchanges and an infinite capital pool. Um, but it started to feel like, okay, no, we, we can make money doing these if we do them right. And, and the, just to, just to come back to it, it was a great feeling, but was it also a relief that you tested the cycle because of all this fucking infrastructure that you needed? Yeah, it, it was. And I think maybe for more pe for some other people, even more so than I, I think I, I, I've always been like more willing to take wacky things without proof because I sort of think it, it'll work. Um, but 
Um, but but yeah, I, I think that that it was you know there's this really nice feeling of like you know okay like this is you know we're sort of worried that this was just you know never going to work and, and now we're not worried about that. You know mm. now we just know that like this can work. Um, you know not to say that it will always work, but like you know there's no sort of like you know there's no catch of like but this will never actually make money. Um, mm. and, and I think that that was a pretty big release relief and it was pretty motivating to keep trying to build things out because it all of a sudden seemed like, yeah, clearly this guy is the limit. Do you find that um, the real challenge is that you had, when, you're, when you're on the gravy train and you've actually got it to work, how did you, or just give us an example of how you scaled up. Like, how did you find, I see you've got a team of you know, traders behind you. How do you get how do you get all the pieces in place? Good question. Poorly. And, and, yeah. yeah, poorly. Oh, I, I mean, trial and error and a lot of error. Um, and he bought the gaming chairs and that was it. Right? The people that, came. That's right. It turns out you needed people to sit in them. The chairs themselves didn't do a lot. Um, yeah. No, um, you know, but 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 no, this, this is a huge problem for us. And, you know, what happened yeah. basically was that we clearly needed to scale the team up a ton to be able to do what we wanted to do. I mean, we're sure. just like you needed 10 times the manpower that we had and we were doing everything we could to try and scale it up. But the problem that we've ran into was that um, you know, when, you, when you're a five person company and then you send a market order for another 30 people in a month, it's a lot of growth and it's not easy to manage that and it's not easy mm. to hire that well. And I never run a business before of any type. Mm. I, I, I had experience mentoring people, but the thing about mentoring people is if it doesn't work, you know, just say, yeah, whatever, they screwed up. You know? Yeah, just move on. So be it. That, that, that's not a good answer, right? But it's true. Yeah. Right, your it's hands true. Are, your yeah. hands are off, right? And, and that's understood. You know, when you're sort of like a, you know, third year employee at a company, you're not expected to work miracles and save every possible situation. You're, you're expected to give a real fighting chance to anyone you're mentoring. Mm-hmm. And if it doesn't work, it up, when you're running a company, you're not supposed to give a fighting chance to the team. Like, that's yeah. not how it works, you know? And, and so I think that, like, you know, I, I didn't have that context. And basically, when things got bad, you know, when, when we lost a little bit of money, um, it just, like, was terrible in so many mm. ways I didn't predict. Because it, it wasn't just that, that we lost uh, some money. It was that we lost our, our, our will and our confidence that we could do good trades, you know? Mm. And, um, and there's all of a sudden tons of conflict on the team. That right. didn't exist yeah. before because it's easy for everyone to agree when everything's going well. Everyone's just like, "Yes, what we're doing is making money. Let's let's make money. Let's keep doing it. This is good." Is there like a leap of faith for the people you brought into the team, basically? Yeah, that that's yeah. exactly right. And 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 as soon as like you know results start to not look good, everyone's like, "Wait, why are we taking this leap of faith? Like, you know, this seemed like cre- too good to be true, and now it doesn't seem true." Like. Yeah. you know that it's and so you know this com- half the people left is is a huge nightmare wow um and and i had no idea what to do i mean i i was i wasn't sort of actively making it worse but it's not fixing it it's my job to fix it and it wasn't and you know and it's just like I, I was confused and frustrated at why everyone was confused and frustrated and i was sort of like hey guys we just like screwed some things up let's just like fix that and keep going and that 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 didn't work. So yeah, that's, a, that's an honest. That's a good honest. <laughs> so how many people yeah. at Alameda and FTX right now? Like ballpark. Um, you know, Alameda is fifteen or so. FTX has close to a hundred. Oh. I mean, it, 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 there's, there's, there's enough scaling lessons in resource there. Yeah. I mean, I can. I mean, I, yeah. I, I teach entrepreneurship for a living. I, I know the pain of building teams, and then if you lose a lot at one go, it just destroys the business. Yeah. Like that was that to me was a recovery you came out of. You lost so 50%. how did you get through that? It was interesting. Uh, the day that people left, our total company productivity uh, quadrupled. Um, Whoa! Why was is that? Really striking. Because Breaking as news it, here. Yeah. Yeah. You know, basically the answer was that, like, you know, the thing holding us back more so than anything else was, I, you know, conflict and 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 that conflict between team members was coming from conflict about whether the business was going to succeed or whether mm. it had a fighting chance to succeed. And when a lot of people working for a company don't think it's going to work, it's not going to work um, because no one is good at working for a company that they don't believe in. And um, and it just, you know, it, it gets in the way of everything. Like every project can't get off the ground because a lot of people think it's hopeless because mm. the whole thing's hopeless. And, and as soon as that changed, as soon as it was basically filtered to the people who, who were excited about it, 
you yeah. know, basically yeah. overnight, um, you know, that solved the biggest problem that had been stopping us from being able to get our shit together. And in, in really short order, we did get our shit together. Uh, good um, for you, it's it's good, good for you ma'am. Yeah. Yeah, it, 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 a, it was cool to see. There's a, a, a an analogy. Uh, funny enough, this comes from your roots out in the valley or that area. It's called avoiding the cultural cancer. So that the whole idea is early detection in culture. So when mm. you're building teams, it's like yeah. you. So you go in with, look, guys, we're not going to win, right? We, we, you know, we could have some failures here, and that's going to be okay. But we want to learn from them, right? So you set their expectations, but at yeah. the same time, you're looking for that early starts out benign cancer like the cells that you're going to have to eradicate and that's a very ag aggressive way to think about building teams but you've got to get them out yeah for sure right otherwise yeah. it becomes a cancer that kills the company completely agree and it just spread incredibly quickly and it was just like it was just plausible enough that no one you know could quite fully dismiss it mm. and it, it just yeah right. it kills it kills the whole drive i think it's absolutely right and and you know i think the sad thing is like a lot of these were like great you know, well-intentioned, brilliant people. Um, and it wasn't, you know, it just, sure. sometimes it's, it's not the right fit or sometimes it's just not what they believe in or, you know, some random thing goes wrong. Um, and, you know, it's, it's yeah, it's not necessarily about who's good or bad. It's just about who wants to be there and who's on board with the mission of the company as it is. Is there a way you vet for that now? If someone wanted to come and work for you, is, are there questions that you ask that Yeah, get into that? Yeah, I mean, it's become an enormous part of our, our hiring process is trying to figure out who is actually going to be excited here and who's going to be happy here. And a lot of that is, you know, we, we, we try and make it sound bad. You know, we try and talk a lot about all the worst parts of the company and the job when we're hiring because, you know, they're going to they're, they're going to learn about those, you know, one way or the other in, in the end. And we want them to learn about it before they decide whether they're going to join because we don't want them to join if they're not gonna want to be here once they realize what it's like. And, you know, I think there are a lot of amazing parts too. I obviously think it's it's fantastic. And, yeah. But, um, you know, there, there are pros and cons and I think it's really important that people come in with their eyes open. And mm -hmm. I knew I think people sometimes actually do have a sense of like who, what sounds good and what sounds bad to them. And, you know, basically you describe sort of the, 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 the fast moving chaotic nature of the industry. And, and you know, I think some people are like, oh, wow, that sounds super exciting. I think other people are like, oh, boy, that sounds so stressful and unpleasant. And, and I think we're like, great, you know, glad that we had that talk. That's what it's like. And if that sounds stressful or, or unpleasant to you, then, you know, this is, you may be a great person and great worker and brilliant. This isn't the company for you. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, it's just like, but there's no yeah. point pretending that, that, you know, this is what you should do. This, this show is all about, you know, finding um, insightful lessons and, and if we think it's instructful for us it'll be great for us yeah, for sure. etc so i'll give you one I'll, I'll throw you one out there as uh, over the years i've invented a lot of this shit, but i used to say to people you know when i hire people do you surf or swim and i'd say hey, hang on actually swimming's easier than surfing and i'd say can you swim in 20 foot waves let me make that very <laughs> clear right and that gets to your point that it's actually hard so let me tell them about what to, what what could be ahead of them if you had to give a tip about your hiring practices given you've now you've done a bit of tooling up you've scaled do you have a do you have one favorite question or approach you take for hiring i mean, it totally depends on the role you know for for different roles there's just like different things that are important and so um you know there's some things that are that are sort of shared but a lot of it is is you know it's somewhat different um and, and you know frankly i i wish we had better questions i mean i i've sort of tried to think of some and i think i've underperformed what I was hoping um, in, in terms of that. Um, but, you know, I think that like one of the things that I like doing is just sort of describing day to day here and, you know, just listening to what people's responses like, are they like, that sounds like really unpleasant or they're like, that sounds so much cooler than what I'm doing mm -hmm. right now. Um, that's extremely telling, but you know, I, I think other things, and these are tricky, it's really tricky to get them in a way which isn't so context dependent that you're just filtering for like, have people thought about a very particular situation. But, you know, I, I, I think another side of this is basically filtering for like, um, you know, when faced with a, a, a complex, messy, real world situation um, with high stakes and a lot of uncertainty, um, I, is your instinct like, let's try and figure out, you know, let, let's try and solve this um, and and figure out the, you know, the right way to think about everything and, you know, sort of not, not act until we get there. 
where is your instinct like, you know, we'll do what we can and, you know, we're probably going to do something wrong here and that's okay. And, you know, in different contexts, different ones that are important, but by and large in our company, you know, we do a lot of the second thing. You know, we do a lot of like, look, we're never going to know for sure, but we got to make a call here. And so what's your best guess? And, mm. and you know, do you understand the risks? Do you understand the, the trade-offs here? And, and can, you, can, you, can you make a call which is, uh, you know, well-informed, low downside and high upside? Um, or does that just sort of freak you out and, or, or feel like unclean and like, look, I don't want to do something here until you know the answer. I think the dev side, interestingly, is where we see some of this most clearly of like, you know, there are a lot of really great developers who find it very important to their work that they write beautiful code. And I think that there are advantages to it, but I think that with our industry moves so fast that like you have to iterate, you have to be iterating quickly and you can't get feedback till you launch sure. something. And, and, and there's just, you know, that's been one of our most consistent piece of feedback on developers is that like, you know, given our business and our industry as it is, you know, in order to, to fit in well, it's important that you be, you know, thinking hard about prioritizing the output in the product rather than the code for its own sake, except in you know some circumstances where they where the code is actually filling such a fundamental role that yeah, it's important yeah. that it that it really is you know. Yeah. But I also think that um, I, I talked to you about this, Jack, a while mm. back. You know, I think it's pretty much a proven uh, a proven concept now that in hyper growth markets. You can build out infrastructure on the fly, right? Build your own redundancy. It may not be the most efficient, but you, what you've got to do is secure market, right? You've got to secure the grab. Yeah. And then what you can do asynchronously is then go and build a better system. So go build the second generation or next generation FTX. Exactly. But actually, you've got to go and grab the market. Uh, yeah. it, it, so in, for you, it's perfect, right? You don't need you don't need to have everything, you know, you know bolt and bra exactly belt right. braces that's going to last 10 years, you know? And, 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 you know, you have to be extremely aware of what you can do eventually. You have to make sure that you're not, you know, screwing yourself over. But if you are confident you can get there, you don't have to be there now. And we think about that a lot when it comes to things like matching engine throughput, where we don't need to have a million, t you know, transactions per second capacity with our matching engines. People aren't trying to send that many orders, right? It's like, how many orders are people actually trying to send? You know, they're trying to send 15,000 transactions a second. And so we need to have that much. But that's going to keep going up. And so we need to be able to support the demand right now. And beyond that, it's, you know, we don't want to be spending all of our time focusing on scaling up for demand that isn't there instead of building out the products people want. Um, but we also need to be confident that when demand does come up to 30,000 transactions a second, that we can scale to meet that and that, you know, we can then devote the time to get there. And so I think that's exactly right, just with the caveat of like, you know, thinking, making sure that we understand that there is a, 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 a medium term roadmap to where we're going to need to get. Yeah, totally. mm. Well, I mean, Sam, I know Martin has some views on um, why cryptos exist and what their financial benefit is. But this, for me, there's still a lot of confusion out there as to like exactly what cryptocurrencies are and where they get their value. And you feel like the person to sum this up for the, your average listener in layman terms. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of different types of crypto. I think they get value from different things, sort of a lane, but, but true answer. But maybe to give a few examples of that, like, um, you know, one thing you could look at is Bitcoin and where does it get its value from? It's sort of similar to like, where does gold or a fiat currency get its value from? To some extent, it's our collective imagination. It's us all agreeing that this is the thing we're going to ascribe value to and it being a good enough functional product to be able to hold that value. Um, and I... Uh, that, that's sort of the answer for Bitcoin. I think when you look at some smart contract chains like Ethereum, part of the answer is it's a the world's you know global decentralized computer where you mm -hmm. can submit your own custom code to it and the blockchain will run that code and it will run your applications for you in a decentralized way. And so it gets its value to some extent from its ability to successfully run those programs um, and you know to scale for them and 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 you know, provide the right, you know, uh, guarantees and trust that you need. And then, you know, you can look at Dogecoin and like, where does it get its value from? And I think the answer is, I don't know, where GameStop gets value from, you know, like where's Tesla get some of its value from? You know, you can call it a meme stock, you can call it a, an altcoin, you call it a shitcoin, you can call it what you want, but it, it has value, you know? Hmm. It, if people give it value, then it has value. That's what value means. And, uh, you know, sort of like, you know, I uh, deny that at your own risk. Yeah, I guess the tricky part with something like that is 
does the value evaporate once people are off it if it's not based on something tangible, oh, yeah. isn't it? That's, Absolutely. I guess, what's hard to get your head around. No, it, yeah. it totally could. And and I think that because of that, if it's not based on something tangible, you know, you have to have a sense of are people going to give up on it? You know, I mean, there's same with gold, right? Gold's value would evaporate if everyone got bored of, of gold. Hey, totally. Um, yeah. But, you know, people probably won't get totally bored of it. They might get somewhat. And I think that, yeah, with these things, you have to decide, like, is this a flash in the pan? Or is this something the world is going to remain excited about and maybe even get more excited about over time? It's not always obvious, but I think that's a lot of what determines what the real value should be a, a, of a token. Can, can I can I can I can I add to that and say to you that if someone finds a, a rough diamond, right, and there's a process to cut that diamond a number of ways, let's just say if it takes six steps, it never changes. Mm-hmm. That's it. Mm-hmm. That's diamonds. The only other thing is there's a, a certain amount of supply, and that's it. Mm-hmm. If someone decides to sit down at a restaurant the same day every day because they think it's great and they've got the most valued seat, they enjoy the conversation, that's value. They pay for it, mm-hmm. right? But actually the best value is the value that has multiple applications and can scale, yep. right? So so you think about Bitcoin and the multiple uses of Bitcoin or XRP in terms of low, you know, low, low commission costs, really fast, you know, really fast uh, um, settlement. The question is the application, right? Because you're not just ascribing a value that you think, you know what, I just love the idea of cryptocurrency. I like the idea yeah. of being able to work across the globe mm. and not have anyone f***ing around with my money. However, I want to be able to use it in every, you know, in many different applications. That scalability is probably the ultimate value, right? I tend to agree. I mean, I, I think that, I don't know if I'd say it's the ultimate value, but I think it is a big ultimate value. And I think that it's one that people don't think about very well. And in mm-hmm. particular, I think people are kind of short-sighted with respect to it isn't that the most important factor in terms of the staying power of a coin well it's a good question it does not empirically seem to correlate that closely with value uh with with market cap of tokens right now i think it might come to do so more over time um but it's i think that you know if you look at the biggest tokens right now they're not the most scaling tokens um and you know, I think that one thing that's going on here, and I don't know for sure, but my best guess is that people just don't think far enough in advance and that people basically think like, well, how many transactions do I want to send? How many transactions does each network has? Which have enough? Great. Let's go with these. Um, and what they don't think is in six years, so like specifically selecting for the cases that matter the most, specifically selecting for the cases where crypto gets huge, um, how many transactions am I going to want to send? And what is able to scale up to that? And that just gives you very different answers. Um, mm. Because right now, the answer is that you need like, you know, a, a, a thousand mm-hmm. transactions a second, roughly, uh, to run the applications that exist in, in decentralized finance. Um, but I don't know, how many tweets do you think there are a second? It, it, it's more than a thousand. It, it turns out it's like a yeah. hundred thousand, right? And how many trades are there on New York Stock Exchange per second? How many Facebook likes are there per second? How many Visa payments are there per second? How, you you can look at all these things in the real world, and when you have a billion users, it turns out you often have like a, a you know fifty thousand to five million transactions a second. Is like sort of the sweet spot for like global scale programs, and almost no blockchains even have it in their roadmap to eventually get up to anything close to that. And so even if many of them can scale to what we have right now, most of them cannot scale to where things are supposed to go. And I... Whatever. They can't scale to that ever, you think? Ever. Oh, wow. And, and that that's like kind of a big deal. And when you hear people talking about it, they don't talk about it as if that's going to be and important to get there. It's just not part of their mental picture of things. Um, and I think that's a big oversight a lot of people have had is just thinking too short term in terms of what the demand is going to be. This this area fascinates me because having built a lot of technology over the years, I just love the concept of centralized versus decentralized and what that means to infrastructure, what it means to yep. bandwidth. Mm-hmm. Um, I can tell you, being a math guy, being a guy that's built computers, gone through the whole thing, that 5 million transactions per second is not intellectually difficult to do Mm -hmm. the problem is when you put it into a network right now all of a sudden it becomes huge but what you're saying is 
And let's assume the world's not devoid of visionaries, right? That if you can pick a if you can pick a coin that you think's just got the ultimate underlying ecosystem, and you can say, I'm gonna I'm gonna build out that and make sure it can transmit five million transactions per second, right? The question is do you need a mix of a centralized and decentralized structure? So I'm coming, we're going to talk about DeFi, but this idea that you might need a, a, a centralized coin uh, or something in which you can ultimately distribute your, your server input. Think of Google. Can it be centralized, though, if it can't even handle the transactions? Because that, well, that's what I hear from that. When it's can't completely handle decentralized, it. That, then, then it becomes... It becomes reliant on, on the globality of, of the infrastructure, right? And and that's got different transmission speeds. But if you can centralize part of the architecture mm. and then decentralize the rest, uh, got you, you can mean. get it up. I'm interested. I mean, I'm sure you've thought about this because this is the goal run, right? Or if you if you can right. find if you can find the ultimate currency and then you're and you you you're a visionary and you clearly are thinking about the future. This is a problem you got to solve. Is it sit in the DeFi world, the CeFi world? You know, what currency is it and how do you how do you think about ultimately what that architecture looks like? Yeah, it's a really good question. And you know, the first thing I would do is start from the things you're most confident in and then work out from there. So what are the things you're most confident in? What can some things never do? Um, what can DeFi never do? Never is a strong word, but if you really want to be globally decentralized, what does that imply? Well it implies that you are you probably have some nodes all across the world. And that in order for a transaction to happen, it has to go through a bunch of those nodes, which means light has to travel around the world. Anytime anything happens in DeFi, every single tick has to be light traveling around the world. And that 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 takes like 100 milliseconds. So that just gives a theoretical lower bound basically to how fast DeFi can be, right? DeFi's clock speed cannot get faster than 100 milliseconds. And, no. and so if you have any program that is deeply going to care about like back and forth or interactivity on a scale faster than that, that interaction cannot happen in DeFi. It has to be more centralized. And so you just say, okay, well, do, do you care about that? And the answer is, I don't know. Some things do, some things don't, right? When you're tweeting, sure. you don't care. No one no. cares about a hundred millisecond delay in sending a tweet. It's like three seconds from GUIs for reasons no one understands, right? So <laughs> totally fine to put Twitter on DeFi, right? Not relevant. Um, when you have two HFT firms trading against each other, do they care about 100 milliseconds delay? Absolutely. Sure. You know, two HFT firms trading against each other would be really hard for that to be in DeFi. Um, and you can just basically go through task by task and say, like, can this fit in DeFi? I think there's about half of things can and half can't in terms of the world's activity. Um, so, okay, so you can cross off half of things, um, but half the world is, you know, the half that's remaining, that, that's big. Like, obviously, you get half the world on DeFi. That's spectacular. I mean, that's that's you know 100 trillion dollars value, um, in, in DeFi at, at least. You know, pro probably more. So, um, so so you say, okay, we have with that. Now, how about how about throughput? Like, how much? So, so we talked about sort of latency, but like, how much total can you get through a decentralized network for a second, right? And, um, this one's actually a little bit subtle. It's not really totally clear that there are fundamental constraints on this, um. You know, there are constraints on comp like like you like our computers fast enough, right? Or or not fast enough, but the you can parallelize it is, is part of this thing, right? Like if you just have a bunch of independent shit going through a network, it's not that hard because you you can always rent more computers. Um, the truth is that like compute is not the most scarce resource. Um, mm -hmm. Agree. And so the the bottlenecks are latency, and then the other big bottleneck here is is um single points that lots of programs flow through. So you can have, you know, theoretically 10 million transfers happening at once on a network. Mm -hmm. But if 10 million people all want to, to, to move the same token at once from the same mm -hmm. address, you can't process those in parallel. They're all drawing on the same resource. Those have to go one by one. And then you're limited by computer's clock speed, right? Because then you can't have, you can't meaningfully have different computers processing those in parallel, they're going to run into each other. And so, so, so the other fundamental constraint is basically that in the end, um, no matter how big your decentralized network is, in terms of things which cannot be paralyzed, things which which conflict in terms of what they spend, um, you can't have more than can flow through one computer. Um, and that's, by the way, basically true of a centralized network as well. 
and, mm-hmm. and when, when we think about scaling FTX, that is the hard part. If we could mm-hmm. just rent more boxes and scale up, like it would just not be a problem. We'd be like, why would we ever build a good system? Like, f- it. yes, we'll double our AWS bill. No big deal. Right, right, right. right. But um, the problem is that, you know, when you do that, you can't, like two people are trying to lift the same offer in the same order book. Mm-hmm. You can't have them just going through different computers and non-interacting, right? Like, like only one of them can buy that. And, 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 and you run into all of these things where there are bottlenecks, where it's either impossible or in many cases possible, but very tricky to safely parallelize things like risk checks on an account. So you don't want them to be able to spend the same risk check twice. Mm. So there's sort of like fundamental constraints on it, but you know, that leaves a lot of the world, right? So like, like you know, HFT firms are not gonna be trading with each other on, on DeFi, but Robinhood could be in DeFi. Because Robinhood's traders, I mean, that that that's a GUI that takes a, a second to use, right? 100 sure. milliseconds is not not important on that scale. So, so, so sort of like, you know, the, the low engagement retail financial applications can absolutely happen in DeFi. Um, Got you. And long time scale applications, you mm-hmm. know, some borrow and lending can happen in DeFi because you're not constantly wiggling things in and out. Um, so, you know, so 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 that, that that that's sort of like a sense of what you could and couldn't put there, and um. And then obviously you can think about what's the advantage, you know, what, what, for which things do you get a ton of value out of putting them in DeFi, which things do you really not want flowing through centralized systems? And, you know, I tend to think actually we don't have great instincts on that question, that people think they know the answer, but when you really drill into it, you can make comparably compelling arguments for a lot of things. Mm-hmm. I think it, it's going to be super contingent. We'll see how things play out, but I think for a ton of the world and a ton of the world's infrastructure, there's actually yeah. decently compelling arguments for why it might make sense to put it in DeFi yeah. if it's not what, super what, latency what, sensitive. What, 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 what I sense, Sam, and, and, and this, is, you know, this is a compliment, and, and because I, I, I see a lot of people that start from the how, they stumble on something they had, and they continue going, and they don't go back to the why. Mm. But yeah. uh, you, you tend to be very rooted, uh, as I am, and, and, and I think the, the correct place to start is, why are we doing this in the first place? Do we continually go back to, does this make sense? And along that why question, just why bother with DeFi? Just make the argument for why DeFi is important or decentralized finance. So I'm not going to make the argument for why it's definitely important. I'm going to make the argument for why it's plausibly important. Because okay. I think it's very hard to prove something here. And in the end, this is going to come down to judgment calls. And, Fair point. You know, what my goal is to get people to a point where they think that a lot of people might think it would be important and that it's plausibly very important. What are some arguments here? Um, I don't know. Let's think about, like, what were some of the biggest shows that big companies have gone through over the last year? Really negative incidents that really hurt their user base. I don't know. She's like, neat, neat. like, what are the first ones that come to mind? Well, take Enron. Yeah. Okay. Great. Enron. Not a good. Ex- not a. Not a. Not. Not a good. Um. You know. Situation. I. I, I admit and that was a, a, a bit of a curveball, but but I think they all right, apply. Yeah. They all apply, right? What What happened with Enron? Well, they cook their books. You know, what could you do? Well, if you make books be on chain, uh, at least some pieces of it, some checksums for it, it makes it a lot harder to fabricate them. You know, hmm. what else? You know in the last year has had a total show or at least had a lot of controversy and, and pushback uh, how, how about price fixing let's take in one of the many that are out there right now in the last couple of years. let's take elon's uh, 420 bucks yeah um so you know i think when you look at price fixing this is an interesting thing i think there are different cases of this i think on some of them you just you have to decide what the laws should be um on others though you know when you look at things like libor right the libor scandal Part of the problem is it's a completely bespoke rate that that was not calculated in a transparent or straightforward manner. It was very hard to vet, very hard to like see if it was biased. And that's something DeFi could absolutely help with, right? You make the process transparent and people can't just like systematically bias it in, in their direction silently, right? What else? You know, how, think about social media around the election, right? And there's huge mm. controversies. You know, 2016 social media did not block anything. And they got absolutely destroyed for not blocking basically Russian propaganda. And then in 2020, social media banned a bunch of propaganda, including Trump's account, and they got absolutely destroyed for intervening in a partisan way. And it's a little bit damned if you do, damned if you don't. But 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 what it exposed is like no one knows what the right answer is here. But like it's a little weird if the answer is like Jack Dorsey, right? If the answer is like that's the guy who decides what the world gets to see. Um, yeah. And nothing against them, but like it. 
and, and so I think that that's a compelling case for why, you know, if you build DeFi social media, what can you do? Well, you can have the underlying blockchains are censorship resistant and people can post whatever they want, upload whatever they want there. And then anyone can host a GUI that draws from the blockchain data. And you can host your own GUI that censors or doesn't censor, or does whatever you want. And anyone can access the data if they want to, to host a platform or a GUI that does it, but the data is all free and all the platforms can access the yeah. same underlying data. I don't know if it's the right answer, but it's at least a pretty plausible solution to yeah. this question. Yeah. Yeah. You know, where you can let people choose whether they want to be on a censored or, or censorship resistant platform. And I don't mean that in a leading way. I think there are compelling reasons to want to be on a censored platform. There are a lot of things I don't want to see on my feed. You know, I kind of want some moderators to be like filtering those out. But if the mods go crazy, I'm like, if there's another GUI, all my tweets are still there. I'll just go to this other group that doesn't have mods. So, okay, so that's another one. How about Robinhood, right? I mean, Robinhood has had some pretty bad days, one in particular. And what happened was a completely nightmarishly complex and intricate financial system where no one knew where anyone's money was for sure. No one, Robinhood wasn't custodying funds. There's separate custodians and clearing firms for the dollars and the stocks are all over the place. No one knew for sure if anyone was going to deliver anything anywhere. And so the SEC is like, you got to post $5 billion of collateral despite having no positions because your customers might fall down. And, 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 and you know, the money they sent in might not make it or have made it or might be recalled. Mm -hmm. And like, that's the thing where if you have actual straightforward transparency about what is where, you don't need to worry about that. Um, yeah. Yeah. But, uh, you know, if you don't, then you just have this massive system relying on trust and and it, it just breaks down sometimes. And so I think, like, that's another case where, like, there's at least a compelling reason that, you know, DeFi wouldn't have had that problem. Um, well, it, it that, might also yeah. reduce capital adequacy. The tradition, it's a... We could talk forever on de decentralized finance yep. because it, there's so many angles. Like, I mean, the argument, I think the biggest one, that, and I love the fact that you didn't say you fully commit this could be successful because a lot of the current system works because it has checks and balances and they're not evolved, but, but they always yep. expose in the end something bad that's off balance sheet or someone f***ing around. But the we is smarter than me. Right, that's the idea of an yeah. open source decentralized transparent yeah. system is that the collective masses say, I think this is good for humanity, right? That's kind of a, a pretty a, a pretty a pretty cool argument. But but what the, where that ends, I'm fascinated to, to to find out. I mean, thinking about the future, for you, yeah. Sam, what are the currencies to watch? Like Bitcoin's had a boom, Ethereum's rocketed in the last year. What crypto should everyone know the name of? Dogecoin. Everyone already knows that name, but you should. I mean it's just like I don't know how it's going to go in the end, but that is, um, you know how time has that like person of the year thing? If yeah. there's like an asset of the year for 2020 and 2021, it would be Dogecoin. That is the asset that accurately reflects our current economic climate. That is the asset that we have all chosen and that we deserve for better or for worse. Well, um, you heard it. <laughs> and I don't say that as an endorsement or an anti-endorsement mm -hmm. of it. I'm not trying to take a position on it. I'm just saying, Everything we as a society have decided over the last year has been dragging us closer and closer to the Dogecoin financial standard. I, I got I to gotta press here just to make sure before I start moving some positions. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was going to say. You heard it here. Hey, hold up. <laughs> Just for transparency, uh, yeah, I'm not in Dogecoin, right? At least not yet. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but what, what's your? Why do you say we've all we've all chosen? I'm just would would love to know, like, what, yeah. what 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 what's your early evidence that that we've met other than Elon saying <laughs> choose Doge, right, Dogecoin? Right. And you know, one thing I want to say is it's up 100x. So like, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a good buy or a sell here. I mean, you have to decide whether we've chosen it more or less than the amount it's already appreciated. I don't know. Yeah. Um, right. But but you know. What, what what have we done as a society that that makes, you know, when did we swipe right on Dogecoin? There's just right. been a ton of things, right? And so I, Elon is, is actually a powerful piece of this. He is the most influential man on, in the world when it comes to um, financial assets right now. You know, his tweets move markets. He chose Dogecoin and no one was surprised. Everyone kind of knew he'd choose Dogecoin. Right. It's not like you're like, oh, geez, that's way choose. You're like, OK, no, obviously, actually, in retrospect, that, mm -hmm. that's what he's going to. Right. And, and and we chose Elon. Right. We we signed up for this. Right. We we signed up for some amount of um, self-aware mockery for some amount of, you know, a sense of humor and for some amount of challenging norms and saying, OK, but seriously, maybe 
what makes your thing better than Dogecoin? You know, no really answer me that. Yes, I realize it's a meme. My question still stands. Um, you know, I think that when you look at what happened on GameStop Day, um, like the, the only surprising thing was that it wasn't a cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. um, because that pattern just happens all the time in crypto. It's, it's not unusual. Um, and the moment, like the moment that, that Robinhood banned buying of GameStop, do you know what happened? Hundreds of millions of dollars flowed instantly into Dogecoin, directly out of GameStop into Dogecoin. Wow. Um, because those are the same type of asset. People see those very similarly, right? If you really drill into why were people buying GameStop, it was a f you. Yeah. Combined with a little bit of like, look, you think that this thing is cheap? I don't think you understand markets. You know, yeah. I think we understand something you don't, which is that if we all get together on social media and decide with it's our valuable. collective imagination that this thing has value mm. and you decide it doesn't, why are you so sure you're right? You know, maybe maybe you're not quite as right as you think you are, or not as clearly right as you think you are. What if we collectively on social media actually have more capital than you do? Yeah, yeah. It's a super, it's a super interesting question, but do, do you think yeah. that that's sustainable in Dogecoin? Do, like, do you think the the way the application works. I mean, perhaps you want to... Just How does the application of Dogecoin work? I was going to say, maybe that's the question of just, you know, what's un, what's what separates it, it from other coins? It is, as one of my colleagues and friends put it, objectively the funniest cryptocurrency. That's what separates it. it it's not the tech. No one thinks it's the tech. No one even tries to argue it's the tech. No one who's buying it buys it for the tech or the product or the roadmap. They buy it because it's the funny looking dog and the fact that it's pronounced doge and it's doge. Kind of dog but it's not that's why they buy it. are you being no, fucking serious no, right now no he's, yeah he's, sam has he's, answered this exactly how i would answer it i mean it, 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 there's nothing else yo and yeah, yet we're ascribing value to it so then well, and, i need the, i need the dogecoin marketeers to come and work for me <laughs> and you know what the cool thing is there's no fucking dogecoin company they don't hire anyone to market it the founder <laughs> gave insane. up on the cryptocurrency a decade ago um, no, a decade, but like five years ago, like, right, right. Who's their market here? It's Elon Musk, and it's Reddit, and it's Twitter, right? <laughs> and it's just a bunch of people getting together. It's it's memes, right? Like, what's their right. most powerful right. brand? It's that picture of like the, the kind of like cloud yeah. coming over Scooby the city with like the the Dogecoin face. And it's like, you know, the the, the Dogecoin. Scooby Doo, but, Sam. Completely agree. It could have been Scooby Coin. I gotta um, look at this. Hold on. I'm just looking. I'm gonna look at this. Why can it? This is the question. Can, why can it not be? To be fair, I would buy this coin. He, look, he looks cool. Yeah, it's super sick, cool. right? But the but, coin but looks cool. Do we need anything <laughs> yeah. else for this to be a, a to, to, to be a permanent currency? If we all subscribe, well, that this is the means. What 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 makes Bitcoin worth more than Dogecoin? I, well, I agree. No, I totally agree. Yeah. Well, well, I always thought Bitcoin. I mean, in my basic view of crypto, is it's just this it's the most stable so that's why everyone goes oh, for yeah. bitcoin absolutely like a huge built-in advantage but if enough people get together and decide that really it's dogecoin now could that shift yes no Maybe. but then won't it once people move on to another coin it gets its 15 minutes of fame and then it drops off loyalty. it's like a, a an instagram you coin do you know what I mean? yeah you need loyalty you need loyalty uh, yeah. if you don't so have how loyalty. do you build loyalty for dogecoin outside of it's a really you know, interesting question. That is the collective experiment that the world is undergoing right now. Right? <laughs> I don't like this experiment, man. But it's not just Dogecoin, right? <laughs> how, about, how about, like, what is Elon Musk's best product? What is the most valuable product that he has built? His voice. His voice. Him. It, his him, brand. <laughs> yeah. The, it ain't his the, product, the ticker right? TSLA, right, that, like, the ticker TSLA is worth so much more than electric cars. and For sure. You know, and what's the ticker TSLA? Tesla. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, got yeah, you, right. got you, got you. Yeah, it's just like, right, you see this all over the place, and it's becoming a bigger and bigger part of our financial ecosystem because for the first time, you know, you look historically about what could cause something to massively appreciate in price, and there are basically two things. Either um, it has to just be a company that makes so much money it's paying huge dividends, or the, the global wealth management platforms had to get together and, and decide that it was a great company and they're going to put all their funds money into it. Right. And those are both sort of like not going to buy Dogecoin. Right. Those mm. aren't the force. And, and, and there's not, nothing else big enough to, to make something be worth a ton. And what's happened this last decade is social media. 
all of a sudden, for the first time, 10 million people all across the world can get together and tweet at each other. And, and you know, agree via shit posting memes on, on Reddit and Twitter about what they're into. And they can coordinate, not explicitly even, just implicitly. And you put those 10 million people together. And even if they only have $1,000 each, that's $10 billion of inflows. And that that rivals the inflows that you get from the biggest institutions in the world. Yeah. And and so all of a sudden you have this global decentralized network of pe- you know, bored people at home on their computers who collectively are, you know, the biggest pension fund, the biggest mutual fund, the biggest ETF in the world. And they don't have the same, you know, sort of they don't have the same you know, fiduciary duty to shareholders that Fidelity has. They don't have the same institutional history. They can buy whatever the f*** they want, and if they want to buy a Dogecoin, they're going to buy a f***ing Dogecoin. <laughs> I love this. It's crazy. Right, so let, let's, let's hit Bitcoin. Is it going up, and how much further? Like, in your opinion, what's happening to Bitcoin? I... Uh, I, it's one of the things I have the weakest opinions on because it just has the most forces on it and it's one of the more efficient things in the space. That's a physics answer, by but, the way. That's a very it, clever yes, it's answer. A boring answer. You're going to start well, talking electrons. Yeah, l- let me give you like two opposing forces here, um, mm-hmm. which I think are, are going to play a huge role. One of them is um, uh, leverage. The crypto mm-hmm. industry is leveraged long crypto right now. Right. That's why when crypto crashes, it crashes more because they get liquidated. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that causes even more selling. And if you want to tell a story where, where Bitcoin goes down to $15,000 in the next few months, it, it, it's it's $7 billion of liquidations. You know, stringing together with some bad news and some institutions dumping. And it's just a bloody, bloody, Boom. bloody day. Right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and all of a sudden, the narrative changes. And it's 2018 all over again. And people are like, what the f*** were we thinking? Like, obviously, this was a bomb. Yeah. In the last year, we've gone from something like 5% of financial institutions to, to something like 80% that have decided that they will eventually do something in crypto. Mm. Yep. They this haven't really huge. done mm. it yet, mostly. You no. talk to almost all of them. They don't even know what they're going to do. They're trying to figure that out. Do you think, though, they won't adopt Do- Dogecoin purely because they will view it differently compared it's to how... It's a really good question. It's not going to be the first thing they buy, right? They're going to go no. good yeah. It's not in their culture. Yeah, that's it's what I'm saying. Culture. It's, it's so alien to culture. them. Yes. Yeah. And the world is getting more competitive and faster paced. And people who refuse to follow financial incentives are getting fucked. And they're, they're just blowing out. And the world's becoming more connected. Information is getting freer. And it's easier for everyone to see who's losing money because of this. The world is changing. And even mm. the stodgiest places are changing. They're changing more slowly, but they are changing. And I think Tesla taught a lesson to a lot of hedge funds. I think there are a lot of hedge funds that were short Tesla, and they all mm-hmm. lost enormous amounts of money. And I think they're going to all look at Dogecoin, and they're going to have a little bit of PTSD, right? They're going to they're be like, oh boy, we've been there before. Like, we don't, I mean, we don't want to be Melvin Capital. Like, I don't, I, you know, this doesn't, I, I don't know, like every bone in our body is telling us to short this, but um, but also we kind of blew out last time we listened to every bone in our body telling and, and, and so I think people are gonna be a lot more hesitant to bet against it um, And you're gonna get the renegades the kind class who are gonna say F- all you guys I'm just gonna buy yeah. it and make a lot of money and I'm gonna be right and you're yeah. gonna be wrong and yeah fine Don't invite me to your dinner party for three months and six months. I'll be the most popular guest in town for having mm. called it correctly and right and, and I do think we're seeing some of that change. It's not all or nothing. It's bit by bit but it, institutions are not going to be as Dogecoin unfriendly as they used to be. In-